Hey, what's it like to shoot archery over in South Africa? Well, today we're going to find out. Hi, my name is Roy Canterbury, and we host it today on Archer Talk 101, and I have work on the line with us, and he's going to tell us about his archery journey and all of some fantastic stories of uh, bow hunting and, and uh, archery in uh, South Africa. Welcome to the show, Mark. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good to be on here. Um, so I'll just give a, like a brief background on how I got into archery. Um, uh, when I was a kid, probably like three years old, my parents bought me one of those little, um, those plastic bow and arrows, and they had those arrows that had a, <clears throat> a plunge on the end. And then as kids, we used to shoot them against the mirrors. <clears throat> and then the arrow would stick to the mirror. Um, so the one day, um, uh, I don't know why I did this, because kids do funny things, but I took off the plunger. So the, the tip was like kind of sharp now. It wasn't like a soft tip. And then um, I was standing at the bottom of the passage uh, down the hallway, and I, I called my mom from the TV room. And then as she walked into sight, I, I pulled the bow back and then I shot and I hit her right on the head there. Oh. And and she, she started bleeding. And then I'd like only noticed like afterwards that I'd done a bad thing, like a stupid thing. Um, and then I got a, a hiding from my father. And then my parents um, confiscated the bow from me. Um, and I was so young, I was like maybe three and a half going on to four years old. Um, but I was, I was so obsessed with the bow that when my parents uh, went to work the next day, I went to my dad's closet and I, um, I took his shoelace out of his running shoes. And then I went to the garden and I chopped a stick um, from one of the trees. And I used my dad's shoelace as the bowstring. Um, and that was the, the first bow I ever made. And um, <clears throat> ever since that, I just started making bows after bows after bows. Um, and then throughout high school, I started making laminated bows. Um, and then I just started like trial and error and carrying on, carrying on making them. It became like an obsession for me. And um, I basically never, ever, ever stopped. You know, like some people go through hobbies and then it like lasts a few years and then they go into something else. So I, I just kept at, at it because it was like a deep um, like passion that I had. and you can always grow as, as a bow maker. So you, you never really reach a, a, a part or like a stage where you can say you're the best you can be. You've always got room to improve. Um, and then um, also one of the reasons why I started making laminated bows is because um, I'm six foot six tall, which is um, quite tall. So my draw length is 32 inches. And I could never find a bow for sale that would not stack at my draw length. Like they, they weren't smooth enough to draw all the way to 32 inches. So I started making my own bows and um, figuring out ways how to make them smoother so that people with like the longer draw lengths can also shoot um, bows, especially shorter bows, because I don't like shooting the those very very long bows, like sixty eight inch long bows. I prefer the the shorter traditional bows, um, just also for hunting reasons because um, they don't they they because they're shorter they don't get in the way and you don't uh, like bumping trees. Um, it's easier to stalk with a shorter bow. Um, so yeah, that's how basically I got into archery. Um, ever it was ever since like a young kid. Um, and I've done quite a quite a lot of hunting in my spare time here in South Africa. Um, most of it's been walk and stalk, um, but there have been like a few few times where I was invited to farms, and we sat in bow blinds and we shot out the blinds. There's it, I know, yeah. I know I've talked to these all that do hunt in Africa. They've got all kinds of different options for for animals to hunt over there. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's lots of species. Um, I can I can just like name twenty off the top of my head, but there's there's even more, and that's just antelope. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot a lot of nice ones over. You got some nice hunting over there, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um. So then, um, when I when I started um, uh, 
like making a lot of laminated bows. Um, it, it became like quite an obsession where when I'd make one and finish it, I'd just shoot it a couple times, times and then immediately start the next one. And obviously, like with the materials you need to make a bow, it started becoming quite expensive. So yeah. um, a friend of mine, um, he just said, well, you like making them so much, why don't you try to sell a few so that you can buy more materials to make more? Um, and at the time, I was doing uh, commercial diving. So I would go off and work um, offshore for about three months, but then I'd come home and have a three-month break. So in, that, in, in those breaks, I would just get stuck into the workshop and obviously started spending a lot of money because I wasn't selling the bows. I was just like either giving them away as Christmas presents to like uncles and or, you know, keeping a lot of them. Um, so I had a friend, he said, why don't you just advertise in a bow hunting magazine here in South Africa and then sell them and then buy more material. So <clears throat> I did that. We have a, um, a bow hunting magazine here in South Africa called The, the Bow Hunter. And I put an ad in the in the the magazine, and it almost became like my job as a commercial diver changed to a, my job as a bow maker, yeah. literally overnight. Um, I just started getting orders in, and then um, a lot of the customers, I had a lot of repeat customers. So like a guy would buy a bow, and then he'd like it so much, he'd order another one from me. Um, and like different poundage, different words. And then um, there's a there's a guy, he's um, quite well known on YouTube. Uh, his name's Jim Grizzly Kent. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah, I have to look him up. Okay, yeah, he lives in the UK um, and he's got a YouTube channel and he's got, he's got quite a couple, a few thousand followers. So <clears throat> me and him started chatting and I said, because I saw he did a lot of, um, reviews on on bows so um i said would you be interested in doing a review in one of my bows if i send you one um so he said yes sure um but he's he just wants to tell me before i send it that he's he's going to be dead honest um because he doesn't want to like um fake that it's a nice bow and then people start buying them and then they complain to him you know so he said when he receives it he's just going to be like thoroughly honest and if he doesn't like the bow, then he won't make the review because he doesn't want to say anything bad. Um, so I said, yeah, you can, we can make that deal. And then I sent it to him. And then he just, uh, the first thing he sent me was um, he had shot his three first arrows and they were, all three of them were in like the, 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 the kill zone on those, <laughs> those 3D targets. And then it took about a month or two and then he, he made a, a review on the bow and it was a very nice review i can also send it to you um and then um a lot of american people and also from like australia basically all over the world um started ordering bows from me uh, so it wasn't i was only selling in south africa now i was selling worldwide and <clears throat> that kind of like took my business off as a custom bow maker um and now I'd say ninety five percent of the the orders that I get all go to the USA. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if they wanted to order one from you, how would they get a hold of you? Um, most of them um order through Facebook. I've got a Facebook page, and that's called Harvey Archery. So it's my surname, which is Harvey, and then Archery. Um, I've also got a website, but. The website is just for you to like read up on the different bow models and that. But um, everyone um, orders through Facebook um, or like email um, because I find um, through like Facebook or email, you get to chat one on one with me and that makes the, the like the build of the bow much more customized and personal. Yeah, it, it does when you when you can do it that way let's see yeah
I'm I'm what well, I'm I'm quiet here because I'm 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 actually looking it up to see if I can get to the site and Okay. Are you going on Facebook or on the website? Uh on Facebook right now. Okay. I got <clears throat> get rid of some of the other junk that keeps popping up out of the way here. <laughs> There we go. Harvey Archery. You got yep. pretty cool looking bows out right on there. The red. Yeah. I like to use I like to use um very unique type of woods. Stuff that you can't just buy in like timber stores and um like at, at places where you'd buy lumber and that I go look for a lot of the stuff myself. Yeah. Um and then I mainly I don't know if you know um uh, it's like a, it's like a it's called burl, and it's basically like um, these big warts that grow off the side of the trees. Oh yeah, those those are some really cool looking wood. Those burls. Yeah, so I, I I'm always on the lookout for for burls. Um, so whenever I, I find I would let's say I find it on like a farmer's land or something, I'll go ask them if I can cut the burl off because if you cut the burl off. You're not really killing the tree. It's just like you're no. pruning off a branch. Um, and then what hap what happens is I'll I'll take that burl home and I'll have to um, leave it for two years before I can touch it because it has to dry out right slowly. And then after it's like dried out for two years, it's not completely dry yet. And then I'll cut it up into the handle block sizes, a little bit oversized. And then I put them into an oven for a week. And then after that, they go into a, um, a stabilizing chamber where they get stabilized and submerged with uh, a type of resin called cactus juice. And that, oh, yeah, that, I've, that hardens I've heard it of that. and gives it I a lot of shape. It yet, but... Okay. Well, you know, I'm, I can share my screen for those that are um, watching. Um, they can see, see the, your website here or your Facebook page. Okay. And yes. you can see some of the, um, some of your bows will kind of go over here and got some really cool looking bows. Yeah. <laughs> and if they yeah, want that to one go happens. on to, to your, your Facebook page and then you can get a hold of you there and then, you know, order and. Open. Yeah. They just, just send, send me a message and it's basically just done just through, through chatting. Um, so if someone wanted to order a bow from me, um, they would choose which model because I have uh, three or four different models of bows, different lengths and different shapes. Um, and then they would get to choose all the woods, what's in, in the riser and the limbs. Um, they get to choose uh, what horn overlays and all the horn overlays that I use are all African antelope. Uh, that one you see there, that's water buck. Um, so you get to totally pick everything that, literally everything that's on the bow yourself. That that's pretty cool. Makes makes a, a definitely a unique one. Uh, um, I had uh, um, I did a podcast here a couple about a week or so ago just on how to uh, customize your ar archery equipment, and this is the place to start with. Is you know get a custom <laughs> bow like this, and then and then you know make your strings and and decorate them up and. You know, I was talking about you know yeah. make strings in different colors and shapes and styles and and yeah. Here at the you, you know I, what I, I, was, I think I would just go with just a plain string because you, you you can't distract from them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and and what I what I've also um found is that the the American bow hunters, they are extremely good bow hunters actually because. Um, out of all the places in the world that buys bows from me, it's it's always the Americans that are seem to be the most successful in hunting. Um, I get pictures, especially during hunting season. I get pictures sent to me on a weekly basis of them, mm. like with their the deer they just shot, or um, so I've got a whole massive catalog full of hunting photos from the guys in America. Oh, it, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I call it. You can't yeah. describe this. Those that want to know what these bows look like, you're just going to have to get out to the his, your page and look at them. 
because they're just they're just so cool. Yeah. You can see all the little burls and stuff. You see that's that's a belly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, and, I, I, could um, look, I could look at them all day long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> them are really cool looking bows. <laughs> yeah, and I think also them, why like a lot of people from overseas also like to buy them not only because of their performance and their looks, is um, because I'm from South Africa. Um, our currency is called rands, and the rand to dollar, um, like our rand isn't too strong. But if people from overseas with stronger currencies buy, then they, they're not actually paying that much as opposed if they were going to order a bow from a bow maker in America, their prices are quite a lot higher. It, and the looks of these, you, you've got some unique ones that you're not going to get yeah. over here. <laughs> and I'm, I'm also, you know, my, the materials I'm using is, is more, more expensive um, than some of the bows. Um, you can also see I use um, a, a, a material called G10. That's that black line through the middle of the riser. That stuff's very, very expensive, but it's, um, it basically makes the bow unbreakable. So you'll never have any issues. Well, and it's worth it if you're going to, you know, spend the money for a bow. You want to, you know, spend, yeah. get good good quality and, you know, yeah. cheap. You can just go anywhere and buy cheap. Yeah, yeah. I put I put that G10 in every single bow I make, just so that I I know that it'll never ever ever give an issue. That's good. That makes it you know really nice. Uh, yeah. You know about you know if you ordered one, about how long would it take for you to get one made? Um, it it, it all depends on how my orders are going. Um, but so to start off, they'd pay a deposit, which is quite a small deposit, and then. It can take up to eight to sixteen weeks. Well, it's made yeah. after you order it, so you know it, it yeah. takes a while to put one of those together, and and especially yeah. all the different laminations and. Yeah. So what I do is like when you make a bow, you can't just start one and finish one. They go through curing processes as well. So, like I could put a bow in the mold. And then I have to wait for it before I can work on it again. So then I'll do like start on another one. So it's not just me um, building one and then when that one's finished, starting the next one. So when I can't do work on a bow because there's some curing time that's needed, then I'll start on like prepping other handle, other risers, um, preparing like tapers for other bows. So <clears throat> that's what um, allows me to, to earn an income from it. Because if you were just making one bow at a time, then start the next, then you would probably earn more money working for, for at like the McDonald's drive-thru. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't because be as much fun, time. but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, as, as you're laminating stuff, you know, you, you laminate them, you glue them, you put them in the, in the mold, and then you got to let them sit. You know, you can't take them out of mold for a while. So, you know, they they yeah. might get in there, I don't know, a day or two or or however long it takes for yeah. whatever the adhesive you're using to cure completely. And yeah, you can't do them all in one shot. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Exactly. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and then also one of the nice thing is um, uh, not everyone asks it, but a lot of uh, a few of my customers um they've always wanted to come hunt in South Africa. So um, if you go look on, on the internet and you want to come hunt in South Africa, um, what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of um, prices that are on the internet for overseas clients. Like they have them, um, an overseas price list. And the overseas price list is, is very high. So, like, I've got uh, friends with, with game farms and that, and they um, they don't really do game farming hunting as, as their source of income. they like cattle farmers or sheep farmers, but they've got all the, the wildlife on their farms. Um, so when, they, when people want to come hunt, I can, I, like, recommend them to go to my friends or something, and then 
like the price is extremely much, much cheaper. Because that's not the main thing they're doing, and you're just yes. going and hunting on a farmer's land. And yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> also, it's it's nice with with the bow hunters because they're not coming there with these uh, big loud rifles and uh, taking shots like near their cattle and scaring their cattle. So <laughs> the bow's nice and quiet. They didn't. The farmer doesn't even know they're there. Yeah, that that's one nice thing about archery is is you can be fairly quiet and and yeah, you know when you can you can shoot your bow and nobody's going to know you shot it. Yes. Um, and and another thing is I I don't know if you've ever heard of a um it's a TV program on Discovery Channel it's called Naked and Afraid. Yeah. So, um, it was about two years ago. Um, because they do their challenges in, in different countries throughout the world, they've done some in Amazon, they've done in Mexico, they've done um, in South Africa, Botswana. <clears throat> so basically they do do these episodes in different parts of the world. <clears throat> and it was about two years ago, I got a, a phone call. It was almost like the person who was phoning me was in a bit of a panic. And they asked me, if I had a long bow that was ready to sell immediately, like, like it was a, a stock bow. So I said, no, sorry, you, you're going to have to like put in an order and wait, wait a bit. And then they were like, Oh damn. Okay. And then that the phone call was over and um, I walked up to my workshop and I, I forgot cause I, I have like a rack in my workshop um, where <clears throat> let's say I'm making a bow for a customer and he wants 43 pounds at 28 inches. So now if, if I don't get that poundage right for him, like if, if it comes out lower, then I have to just put that bow aside and, and start a new one for him. Yeah. Um, if the poundage comes out a little higher, that's great because I can always um, shave off the poundage and bring it down to what he wants, but not if it, it comes out lower. Um, so I walked up to my workshop and then I just looked up at my rack and I was like, oh, actually, you know, I do have a bow. So I phoned this, this person back and I said that I actually, I, I forgot that I, I had a bow here that is ready to go. And they were like, um, oh, thank you so much because this is for, for a TV show. So then I said, what TV show? And they said, uh, naked and afraid. And now I've been watching this on a weekly basis because it was one of like my favorite programs to watch. Yeah. And so it was them. And the thing is that they were coming to film an episode in South Africa. Um, and there was two American contestants doing, doing it. So they'd flown here and the one person wanted to bring their longbow and it got caught up in customs and, because they, I don't know if they didn't have the right paperwork or something, but customs confiscated their bow because they they were being silly, and um, that's why they wanted a bow from me. So um, I sent them my my GPS location, and then the next day the whole discovery uh, team was just arrived at my on my farm, and I invited them into my house and gave them coffee and handed them the bow and then i was because i was being interested in naked and afraid so much i started uh practicing making fire by rubbing sticks together oh yeah and i made all these videos i made <laughs> i made all these videos of me doing that and I was, I was showing them and i said you guys you guys must get me onto naked and afraid because that's like one of my favorite programs to watch so then they said yeah we'll we'll see what we can do and then a couple months went by and i got a phone call and they said, we would like you to um, take part in one of our challenges on Naked and Afraid. So um, I took uh, I took my bow with and they put me in Zambia. Um, and the, the lady that I went with, she was from Louisiana. And they put us on a on an island in the middle of the Zambezi River. And because I thought I knew we were going to Zambia, but I didn't know we were going to put on, be put on an island in the middle of the river. <laughs> So on that island, there was literally no antelope. It was just birds 
crocodiles, hippos, and elephants. There was there was not one warthog, not one impala, nothing. Um, so I had my bow there, and I managed to shoot a, a guinea fowl, which is quite a big size game bird. It's like the size of a chicken. Yeah. And I shot three other smaller birds. So my bow definitely helped me to 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 finish that challenge. Yeah, it gives you some meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On an island with no no small game other than small birds <laughs> or crocodiles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, crocodile would be a little little more difficult with a bow, but yeah, definitely. Um <clears throat> I I did try to go after a crocodile, um, but they they much more clever than I thought. I thought, you know, you could you could like stalk them and try to get close to them, but they they've got like eagle eyes. They see you and they just go underwater. And then they just disappear. Yeah, and you don't go in the water after them, do you? <laughs> no, no. But the crazy thing was, I actually did. Um, I don't know why I did it, but I, I think because I was hungry. But this was on like uh, day 16. Um, I actually swam into the water to try catch a crocodile. It, was, it wasn't a very big one. It was probably about uh, four or five feet. But it was still silly because in the river where, where I went after this one, there's, we saw much bigger crocodiles in the same premises. So that was a little bit uh, dumb of me, but I'll, I'll just blame it on the starvation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you get hungry, do weird things, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, when did that episode air? Um, it aired uh, last year. Um, a season, season 14, episode four. Season 14, episode four. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, we'll have to have to check it out. Yes. Yeah, you can you can watch it um, online. You can just search for it online. And you can see it. Yeah, we'll have to check that out. That that'd be cool. Yeah. So that that's that's quite a quite a story that you got there of how you got on the the show and and what you did on there and um, how did you guys do? I I haven't seen the episode yet, so. Okay, yeah. So, um, I'd say we did well because it's a it's a twenty one day challenge, and um, you all you have to do is you have to make it to the twenty one days, and then if you do that, then you've you basically won the challenge. So we we both got there, um, and and completed it. So it's a, it's a lot of uh, teamwork. Um, it's not a competition between you and your partner. You, uh, you guys actually have to help each other survive till the end. Um, but you, you're allowed to tap out whenever you want. So if you really, really don't want to be there, or if you're really, really suffering, you are allowed to tap out. But then you didn't want to they tap say out. a lot of people, <laughs> no, a lot of people that tap out regret it immediately after they've had their first meal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, why did I do this? Yeah. <laughs> and why did I do this when you start it? And why you do this when you quit early? <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of the um the people that go on it and they they tap out. Um <clears throat> when when people are watching at home, they don't realize how hard it actually is because because of the the starving part. Right. Um like people can go like the whole morning and afternoon without eating and they're complaining that they're hungry. But you go like ten days without eating, then I want to. See, then you can complain. Don't complain after like a day of not having food. <laughs> so, <clears throat> like a lot of people do tap out, and when they do, they kind of get um, ridiculed by the fans that that watch. They say, "Oh, that guy's a wussy. He couldn't make it." But it's actually a uh, hundred times more difficult than what you think when you when you're watching it. Yeah. I I, I can I can imagine you know if you go you know just yeah. a day without eating you start getting hungry and I can imagine you know trying to find something to eat and you're eating whatever you can yeah. they put you on an island with yeah. not a lot of food <clears throat> yeah and at, at night time at the the temperature was like freezing cold so you had to have a, a fire running throughout the whole night um, and then while you when you just fall asleep. 
then you'd get stung by a scorpion or the fire would go out and you start shivering, then you have to make it again. So it was not one night that you had a solid night's sleep. Um, and then during the day, you're getting eaten by horse flies and all, and it's very hot in the day and um, you've got no pillow, no blanket, sleeping in the sand with bugs everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not a lot of fun, but you know, for those that go through and make it, that's, yeah, that's saying quite a bit to be able to go yeah. through and, and, and do all that. That's. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it wasn't, wasn't fun at all, but looking back and knowing that you've accomplished it is like, then that makes it all worth it. Yeah, I have to go through all that that work and to get done. It's like it's an accomplishment that that you can say you did and and you enjoyed and you think back on it. It's like, why'd ever do that? And then you look at it and then yeah. say, well, this is why because it was actually, yeah. you know, looking back, it was fun. Well, he was there, it probably wasn't yes. much fun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the um, like the bow hunting here in South Africa. Um, what a lot of people like doing is literally just um, um, going with their archery equipment, uh, tents, and all their camping gear, and you'd go for like a weekend, long weekend, um, three, four days at a time, um, <clears throat> and you just go into the bush, and while you're hunting, you're exploring, so it's not only hunting, you're also doing a lot of exploring while you're walking and stalking and um there's like a i don't know if you're familiar with the crants in south africa we call it a crant so it's like these big big rock faces on the side of the mountains yeah um that have caves in and all that and um you go explore along those those rock faces and you you find ancient bushman paintings and um it's really like um soul fulfilling you 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 feel good once you come home you know like yeah. recharged of nature. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of cool stuff to see, you know, when, when you're in an area that's been inhabited for thousands of years. Yes. So yeah. Tell us about some of uh, some of your hunts, maybe uh, the, the most memorable hunt you, you've been on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have, I have two. Sorry. So I'm going to tell you about my mistake hunt. It was it was a mistake that became very successful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I like so those. Guys. This was this was the the time that um I was in in a, a bow blind. Um, so I I wasn't really used to sitting in blinds because um I get like ants in my pants and I want to move around and I can't sit still for very long. <laughs> So we were we were in this blind, and I was lucky enough um, to to hunt for free because this this one game farm wanted me to come hunt there, and in return I write them um, a story, and then that story was going to go into a, a magazine. So they just wanted to make sure I had a good time. They they spoiled me with nice food and very nice accommodation. And then I would just have had to have write like a story of my weekend with them and how how nice it was. So um, we we sat in a blind. And so now everything's for free, right? Anything I want to shoot. And I I shot stuff um, like springbuck and impala, mountain reedbuck, because that, that's like the, the smaller type of antelope that isn't too expensive to, to hunt. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to go for since it was free. I wanted to go for the bigger stuff, the more expensive stuff, the stuff that I hadn't got on my bucket list. So <clears throat> I wanted to to go for a wildebeest, um, a wildebeest, and we got into the blind early morning, so the sun hadn't come up yet, and we got in there, and then the sun started coming up, and then in front of the blind there was just springbuck and impala and mountain reedbuck everywhere and and behind them about 40 maybe 40 yards away there were there were three wildebeest um 
and they they seemed hesitant of coming close to the blind. They would like start walking towards it, and then they would think, "Oh no, something something smells fishy," and then they would walk back. And they were doing that literally the whole morning. We were waiting hours, and I could have easily taken a shot um, at the impala or the springbok because they were so close. They were literally maybe ten to twelve yards away from my shooting position. And <clears throat> I started um, needing to go to the toilet. <laughs> and you know when you, you feel like you, you want to cough, but you can't cough loud, and then your throat gets scratchy? Yeah. <laughs> and I started getting hungry, and I was I, I just wanted to now finish up in that blind because we'd already been there for like four or five hours waiting for these wildebeest that were 40 yards just lying under a tree there now. So I said to the, the guy that was in the blind with me, um, okay, let me just go for this impala right here. And then um, I'm sure all, all the archers listening on this, um, this podcast are aware of that, um, that feeling you get called buck fever, <laughs> where you get so excited, your nerves start shaking, and you start shaking, and you don't really – know what you're doing because it's just the nerves are too much because of the excitement um so that that somehow kicked into me and i pulled the bow back and i didn't even aim yet and i think it must have been the nerves so I, I pulled the bow back and i just let the string go and i wasn't even aiming um and then i got it on i got it on video as well so <clears throat> the arrow went under the chest, just under, like, from a side angle. Oh, it, yeah. it went just under the chest of the impala, and then the arrow bounced off a stone, and then it went, like, literally like this, and it, it went right into, like, the perfect shot, the perfect shot placement into that wildebeest <laughs> that was 40 yards behind it. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then um, it was yeah, like a perfect through the chest lung shot, and it's it stood up, and it it didn't know what happened because it was it was lying down like probably having a, a rest, and then it it ran about thirty to forty yards and it it fell over, and so that's why I say that was like one of my most memorable because I wasn't aiming at the <laughs> wildebeest but I want I wanted the wildebeest so badly. And I ended up getting it at the end of the day. Yeah. That is pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah I've, I've a got terrible that, shot I've got and get a better one out of the deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I think after that, it, it boosted my comp confidence because we were there for a few days and everything else was perfect shots, perfect shots. <clears throat> and then um, my, my second most memorable uh, hunt, it was actually on my farm. Um, there's a there's a there's a type of antelope here. It's called a bushbuck, and I don't know if you've heard of a bushbuck. Yeah, I've heard of them. Okay, so so bushbuck they they don't um stay in herds. They like solitary animals. Um, especially the males, they they like to be on their own. Um, and they're very they're very elusive. They some people call them ghosts because. Um, they're very difficult to to find. Um, they like the the thick thick vegetation. We're very dense bush, and then every now and then they'll they'll come out in the late afternoons into a field or something open. Um, <clears throat> and they they very difficult to to get close to as well. They they very switched on animals, very clever. Um, so the one day I was just on my balcony and I looked. We got this farm, we look over into the valley, and I saw a bush buck come out into the field. So I grabbed my bow, and I, I wasn't even wearing camo, I was just wearing a normal, like, um, army colored green t shirt and a pair of shorts. Um, and I just said to myself, let's, let's take the bow, and I'm just going to go for a walk. I'm not going to go for a hunt, I'm just going to go for a walk, and I'm just going to see how close. I can get to that bush buck. And <clears throat> from about maybe 150 yards away, 
um, it, it must have seen me or smelt me, and it ran, it ran straight into the the thick bush. So now I said to myself, like it was a it was a thin strip of of thick bush. It was basically like um, a dried up river type of bush. So there wasn't any water, um, but it was like a channel of bush that was growing in in like a dry riverbed. So I said to myself, okay, well I'm going to go for even more of a walk now, but I'm not going for this bush buck, but if I get close to it, then that's a bonus. So I walked, let's say the bush buck went in this way, I backtracked all the way around to the other side of the bush where it went in this side. So I came in from, from this side <clears throat> and um, the bush was so thick and there were all these, um, these thorns that, that catch onto your clothes. Uh, and they started just like tearing my clothes and, <laughs> And then I was like making so much noise um, that I said to myself, I even started speaking out loud now. I even said a few swear words because of these thorns. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, I just like wanted now to just make my way through this bush so I could go home because I was stuck in all these thorns and that. And then a couple uh, meters ahead of me, I, I saw this, this like body lying down. <clears throat> so immediately <clears throat> my first thing was I, I thought maybe it was like a massive a big stone but then I had like a like a closer look and I saw it had hair on it and they say the bushbuck are known to do this if, if something's chasing them they'll go run into thick bush and they will lie down and hide so this thing was literally maybe 10 or 12 yards in front of me lying down and it thought that I couldn't see it and it was it was so quick. Well, I just picked up my bow and I saw it's um, the, the 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 shoulder area, and I didn't even have time to get buck fever or anything. It was just so quick, and I pulled up. I saw my arrow point onto the shoulder, and I just I shot it. And um, that was also one of that was probably my my like most memorable like successful hunts because it was a very elusive animal and um like the circumstances of that um chance happening was was ourselves at like the right day right time at the right day to get it yeah yeah that is that is pretty lucky when you go out and, and do that yeah. you know, sometimes they yeah. they they like to think they're hidden because they can't see you so they don't figure you can see them but then they leave their vitals yes over. Yes, yeah. And I, I tried many times for a bush buck. Um probably like for, for three years I I tried getting getting close to bush buck and that one was like the, the, the least effort because I was making so much noise and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well you if it'd been sneaking in, you'd probably been running off because it'd have figured that's something different, but it probably just figured yeah. some animal crashing through the bush. Yeah, <clears throat> and another thing, um, uh, what a lot of um, like the the older generation bow hunters in South Africa, they they started learning this this trick, and they they've started passing on this this knowledge, um, to to the the new bow hunters, um. So when when they're doing a, a walk and stalk, and they get close to an animal, and um, let's say the animal senses that you're there, it either hears you or um, it, it sees movement or something like that, then they, they almost stop and they, they stare right at you. Um, and then it won't, it won't last too long before they run away. So, so what, they, what they taught us was when you get to that um, stage and, it's, and it's, it's sensed that you're there, you start picking the grass, like just ripping, ripping out grass. Or, or pulling leaves off of bushes. And <clears throat> I, I've tried it myself, and I, I, I now do it all the time because it works. It, it works 90% of the time. Um, the, the animal that's, that's noticed you, when you start picking up, like pulling grass out the ground, um, it actually sounds like an, another animal eating grass or pulling out leaves. So then what they do is, um, almost all of the time, they carry they carry on doing what they were doing, 
because um it it sounds like you 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 know like a, like a cow or another animal that's pulling out the grass it makes that same 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 sound as if they're eating yeah. um so uh, if, if any guys that are listening to this want to try that um they must definitely give it a go that, because i'll say like if if the animal does sense you and you just try to stay still most of the time they'll they'll just watch you for a couple of seconds and then they're gone anyway so you got no nothing to lose by by just trying that technique out yeah that's that that is something i hadn't even thought about that and heard about that so yeah i learned something yeah. new <laughs> yeah a lot, a lot of guys do that now yeah in south africa because it works so well just bend down and start picking up some grass pull no, some just, grass just out down, pull go down on your knees and start pulling pulling out grass <laughs> <laughs> And the animal thinks that you also browsing and, and eating. That that is yeah. kind of a, a cool little trick to 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 know it. Get out in a situation. I'll just run down and start pulling some grass or pulling some leaves and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't stand still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <you're> kinda... <clears throat> Kind of tell us about your, your challenging hunt when you was on Naked and Afraid. Uh, that is a challenging hunt there when you're you're hungry and you, you got to get some food. It's it's not like now you, yeah. you, you go hunt if you don't get something. Well, okay, next time. But, you know, yeah, that, that yeah, is if a you challenge don't where yeah. you, you're going to starve to death or eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then <clears throat> there was also um, these very tall trees there. And they had these berries in, but... It was those very strange type trees where you get the tree trunk and it goes up of like 20 or 30 yards before there's branches. So it's not like a tree you can really climb because there's no branches to hold on. The branches only start way, way at the top of the tree. And at the top of the tree were these berries that were, that were very sweet and edible. Um, and they were quite um they were quite big as well and the there's a bird called uh, a hornbill and they would they would go up into the tree and start eating these berries but they would drop a lot of them and then we would sit and wait at the bottom of the tree for these berries to fall so <laughs> we had <laughs> we had a, a couple berries every every day so it helped a little bit with getting a bit of sugar into the system yeah, that's where the birds are up there dropping dropping your food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Come, come drop more food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um and then the other birds that I shot, um they were they were they were called wagtails. So they very they're very small birds and they never sit still. So if you see one on a branch, then it's like a second later, and then he's on another branch, and then another branch, and then another branch. So <clears throat> those were those were quite um, difficult to shoot, but I managed to to get three of them. Um, but at the same time, they were they were so small that when you take the feathers off, it looked like the 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 meat of it was like the size of a golf ball, <laughs> and I had to to cut that in half and share half with my partner. Yeah, one bite. <laughs> yeah, one bite each. <laughs> yeah, well, it's better no bites, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so you you um, were, you were making making fire with just rubbing sticks together. Is that how you started your fires? <clears throat> um, I was doing that uh, here at home, um, because you have to use certain types of woods, and I I started um. Uh, trying a lot of the different woods that we have on the farm here. And I eventually found like matching pairs that that worked because you can't just use uh, any any wood. And from where from where I live to where we were in Zambia, the terrain and the trees is completely different because um, it's we're like two thousand five hundred miles uh, distance. So the, the 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 every tree the plant that they have here, we don't have. Yeah, at, at home. So, um, my partner, that girl that was from Louisiana, she, 
um, she bought a flint as one of her survival items because oh, yeah. we were allowed to choose one survival item each and um, she had bought a flint. So we didn't have too much uh, trouble starting starting fires. Yeah, yeah. You, you had <clears throat> and it was also the, yeah, and it was also um very dry there. So the the grass was very very dry. You just hit it with one spark, and it's like boom, fire. That's and then um, <laughs> a lot of people um had their like suspicions about naked and afraid, like. Is it really real? Do they really not give you any food? Do you really sleep alone by yourself at night time? Because there were some speculations. People think when the when the cameras go off, you go sleep in a tent, or um, if you're really hungry, they'll give you an energy bar. So <clears throat> when I went on there, I actually asked one of the cameramen to please give me an energy bar, and they. By law, they're not allowed talking to you. If they if they talk to you, they can get fired from their job. So you can't even ask them what like what day it is. We had to we had to mark in the tree like a notch, so we wouldn't forget how many days we were there. So <clears throat> if you had to try speak to a cameraman, ask them for anything, they just totally ignore you. <clears throat> And then another thing is, I lost um, 13 kgs, which is <clears throat> about 30 pounds. And I have a before and after picture. And then, <clears throat> like if some people tell me, like, was it really, or ask me, was it really real? Um, all I do is I say, okay, this is how I looked like before I went on. And then this is how I looked like after. I didn't even have to... Um, like say anything because the the proof is in how much weight I lost. Yeah, yeah, you you can see yeah. you know even through the show you know that's just in twenty one days. Yeah, and that that's a lot of weight to lose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm clearing my throat. Yeah. <laughs> um, talking for a while, you, trying to get that do... way. Do you, do you do um hunting with the uh, the compound bow or um have you tried with traditional bows as well? Um, I do compound bow. Um, I don't okay. spend the time it takes to get good enough with the my recurve that I want to hunt. Okay. With. <laughs> yeah. And so I sometimes I'm lucky to get enough practice in with the compound. <laughs> yes, I understand. Yeah. <clears throat> I find um um. A, a lot of the guys that eventually spend a lot of time with uh, the compound bows and they become so good at it that they want to have a little bit of a harder challenge. And then they say, okay, let me try out hunting with a, a traditional bow. And that's where like a lot of my cu customers that order bows from me have previously been guys who shoot with a compound bow. And they felt like they, um, they've they've been very successful with the compound, and they just want a little bit of a harder challenge. Um, and then they start going into the the traditional side. Um, so there's there's quite a lot of people that that do that. Yeah, I've I've talked to a few archers that have done that. They they were doing compounds, and then they started shooting their their traditional equipment and and haven't looked back and, and actually yeah home, you know even sold all their compound stuff because they they just want to do the the other stuff and it's so much yeah. fun and i know there's a yeah. a lot of archers out there that shoot traditional equipment and and shoot it very well yeah uh, some guys can get really good yes yeah, sometimes better than the guy <laughs> person standing next to them shooting yeah. compound <laughs> yeah um, and also, um, a lot of um, um, a lot of I get a lot of questions um, from from compound archers. Let's say someone is a compound bow shooter, and they're wanting to to move to traditional um, <clears throat> with the compound bow because when you pull the string all the way back to your full draw length, you get that let off, 
where it's it's now easy to hold the bow. Um, easy to hold your draw because of the the cams. Right. Um, and and normally they have quite high high poundage uh, compound bows because at the end then it all eases off and it's easy to hold. So like some of the guys are shooting with like eighty pound compound bows, and then they would want to order a traditional bow and they would say, "I also wanted eighty pounds," and then I have to try persuade them yeah. to to change that because there's no let off. Um. And I'll I'll try to talk them into going into a lower poundage, um, and then also there's a lot of confusion with the, um, the the killing power, because now you you're going from a compound bow which is high poundage and 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 faster than a traditional bow, and now I'm telling you to go, um, lower poundage, on a traditional bow which shoots a bit slower, um. So the difference is in in the traditional bow, we always recommend going lower poundage to around like um, most of my clients that that have been hunting a long time with traditional bows, they all in the poundage range of between forty two pounds to fifty five pounds. Not many, not many guys are shooting higher poundage than that. And the the difference is is in the arrows. Um, and the broadheads that we use. So the compound bow arrows are normally um, generally lighter in, in mass weight than the traditional arrows. And um, also I'm just saying most guys in the tradition, I mean, in the compound arrows are using either mechanical blade broadheads or three blade broadheads, um, stuff that needs a lot more kinetic energy to pass through an animal. Um, and the traditional guys are using kind of heavy double blade razor sharp broadheads. Um, and I get a lot of pictures from guys that have um, 42 pound bows and they're getting um, pass throughs on the animals that they shoot with a 42 pound. Yeah, you, but the, it's just good, the good whole difference is in the arrow. Shot placement is going to do it for you. Yeah. It's the whole difference is there is in the arrow setup. Yeah, I know my my first deer I shot was uh, uh, fifty two pounds out of my compound. I had uh, the I think it was probably twenty one seventeens with one hundred and forty five grain broadhead, a four blade muzzy on it with feathers. Okay, and I was forty yards away, about twenty feet up in the tree, and that deer turned around. And I think my fletching stopped it from going through. Okay, nice. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now now that you know I, I, I hunt at 70 pounds with a little bit lighter arrow, but yes. uh, um you know it's uh, I I don't shoot that in, in my recurve. My recurve is at 40 or 45 pounds. I think it's 40 pounds. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You know, and you, like you said, you're not gonna shoot the same way because you can't hold yes. it back. Yeah. And then, and then, and then that yeah, the the heavier poundage on the traditional bow just completely affects your your accuracy. And then that's actually the most important part is your accuracy and your shot placement. Yeah, and and if you got too much bow, like Enrique, I've seen guys pull back and they kind of have their hand not even all the way back. They they can't pull it all yes. the way back. And it's like, why are you stopping up here? You're inconsistent. You know, pull it back at that yes. back corner of your mouth. Or blow your chin, or how, wherever you're going to anchor, you know, get back yes. to that consistent anchor, and um, you know, it's it's just it's like you you need to drop down to weight or different yeah. techniques you can get it back all the way. Yeah, <laughs> now, I'm always trying to um, uh, people that order half poundage bows from me. I'm always trying to talk them down to around the fifties, um, because I I had a guy order a sixty eight poundage bow. And I asked him, are you dead sure? Are you dead sure you want 68 pounds? Um, and then they're like, no, they're positive. They want it. They've shot 68 pound bows before and it's easy for them. And then I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then the next day I was just like, are you really sure? And they were like, no, I'm positive. So I made the bow, sent it off. Um, 
he almost got a hernia trying to put the string on the bow. <laughs> and <laughs> and he couldn't pull it back further than like 12 inches. And he said, can I please send it back so you can reduce the poundage? <laughs> you, you told him that. Yeah. It just cost him extra now. I, I, mean, I told you. I told <laughs> you. Now you're making me uh, do extra work. <laughs> <laughs> But you know you yeah. can reduce, like you said earlier, you can reduce the the draw weight. You can't increase it. But yeah, yeah, it's uh... yeah. So it, dep it, it depends on 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 which one of my models. Um, on most of them, I can shave off about six pounds, um, six to eight pounds. I can I can shave off. You don't want to do any more than that. Yeah, yeah. on sixty eight. Yeah, you get it down to sixty. That's still quite a bit of a bow for for recurve. <laughs> Yes. <clears throat> um, and then also, um, uh, I've had to become quite good with um, with shipping. Um, so I've had to get import licenses, export licenses. Yeah. Because I'm sending bows overseas um, all the time, um, which is quite surprising now, is I've sent bows to America and the UK and they get there very fast. Um, the the quickest I've had one arrive is is four days. Oh, that's quick. <laughs> yeah, all the way from South Africa to America to the guy's doorstep in in four days. Yeah, it takes me that long sometimes to get stuff shipped from what from the east coast to the middle Midwest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then <clears throat> also what I do I do for my customers is. Um, when I when I send when I send them the bow, because they now paid me a, a small deposit to start the bow, and then when the bow's finished, then they pay the remainder. On the invoice that I send, um, with with the bow in the box, that is the amount, um, that um customs or VAT duties will. Will will like charge you like import duties or customs right. fees or so the the deposit is is so small that when the bow arrives, um, ninety percent of the time you don't have to pay anything and and if by some small chance, um, someone has to pay, they'll it will only be a certain percentage of like fifty dollars, which is uh, it saves a lot a, lo a lot of money for the customers. Instead of them receiving something and then the full price is written on the invoice, and then you get hit with a huge customs um, or tax. Yeah. So I rather like like to save their money and then they can go buy extra arrows or um, a glove or something to shoot with. Yeah, I I was, had a guy come over from um, I think it was Ireland and order a bow from me, yeah. and he was saying it's like twenty five percent okay. tax on the equipment. Yeah. And he come over and he bought it and I worked on it. I had to make some changes because it wasn't his draw length. So I okay. I had to get some new cams, new new limb, or not new cams, but new cams. Um, and then I made him new string for the right length of the string. And then I was going to ship it back to him. And then it was warranty repair is what I wrote down on there. Because uh, he'd already bought it. He already paid taxes over here. And then he had somebody yes. coming over and they hadn't carried it back. Okay. So, so it's like I didn't even ship it over to him. They, they're yeah. carrying it back. So how did they know it, that it wasn't already their bow? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You know, so like, hey, save you some money. Don't don't pay that yeah. twenty five percent tax on it. You know, that's you know, you yeah. pay quite a bit for the bow, and then come in and and had to wait for a while because I'm I'm waiting for waiting for stuff. I think originally I don't remember what I got. I got part of it in. I think I got the cams in. And then I'm waiting for the strings. Which I'm just going to make him some strings, and and it was kind of a, yeah. a prune um, bow. So I made him a string with silver and mountain berry, which is kind of a maroon color. And, and so okay. I made the string because I had to make a new string, but I made cables for it as well because they had to match. <laughs> yes, you know. So in, yeah. in this case, he's got he got the old cams for the other length and the strings and cables for it, and. You know, of course, uh, no. a lot of manufacturers don't put good quality strings on anyway, but. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I just see now, 
um, my battery is on ten percent. So oh yeah, and if, um, if anyone um, there's uh, wanting to know any other questions or something, I've got about ten minutes left. Yeah, I don't have any questions right now, but uh, okay. um, I uh, yeah, I'll I'll put it I'll put a link to your your Facebook group or your page in the description. Okay, so if they want to get a hold of you, they can get a hold of you. Um, okay. You know, any other links that we we need, you know, we can put in there as well. And okay. we'll just, we'll just uh, um, see if we can get you some more bows sold over here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be nice. And I know where I'm going to go when I when I get ready to get me a custom <laughs> a recurve because <laughs> those, those yes, are yeah. really nice looking bows. It'd be nice having a really cool looking one because <clears> I don't know too many. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody with one that nice of. Uh, as your bows are yeah and and you know <clears throat> um i think the thing that um that speaks well about it is um my customer reviews um i've got a review page on on facebook um also <clears throat> whenever i send the bow um to someone who's ordered ordered from me for the first time because a lot of the guys that order from me most of the time they buy more bows and one guy's got 14 of my oh. bows because <clears throat> uh, because he was he, he likes them so much so he wants one of each model and then one of each model in different words one of each model in different poundages um <clears throat> and then he's got these these racks on his walls where when he's not using them they kind of on display in his house which is a nice wall feature yeah yeah it is um <clears throat> And um, a lot of uh, the traditional archers in America that have been doing archery, archery for a few decades, um, there's there's a lot of great bow makers in, in America and also uh, mass-produced bows, like, for instance, Martin Archery, um, Black Widow. Um, those are like the Black Widow bows, very, very expensive bows. And a lot of the people that have ordered from me the first time have a collection of all these other bows that are some of the, the top rated bows in America. And they all tell me that they're going to now sell their Black Widow bows or sell the other bows and then start so they can order more of mine. Um, and then all these reviews, I, I screenshot, screenshot them and I put them in a folder so that uh, people can see that it's not just me saying I'm I'm good. There's there's like the customer customer feedback, which is last nice, nice to read. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, yeah we'll we'll get some we'll get some people interested in it. And I know we've got a lot of people listen to the podcasts and not just on Spotify but on Audible and yeah. and you know I think uh, Apple Podcast has them. I think there's a Google Podcast that goes out to but. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's uh um quite well distributed around and and we'll, we'll get we'll get some going. But it's been really really great talking with you. I, I learned yeah. a lot about uh, uh, bow making and and um the the TV show Naked and Afraid. And I watch a little. Okay. I don't watch it as much as what you did, but um, my wife <laughs> watches it more than I do. So I'm doing other things. Okay. But um yeah, yeah I watched a few of them. We'll have to get that one. That was what uh. Season eight, eighteen. Uh, um, which one? My one. Yeah, yours. Uh, it was uh, season fourteen, episode four. Ep fourteen and four. Okay. Yeah, I fourteen and four. Remember that. Fourteen and four. <laughs> okay. I write it down so I won't forget it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I, I have to write things was... down so I remember them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then just one more thing is that I remembered. Um. Um, my mother had, had, since we were in preschool, she had kept like, um, journals, like of all our paintings we did in school and all the drawings we did in school, um, from when we were very, very young, like preschool. Um, and she's got this big kist and she's got my brother's, all his artwork from when he was a kid growing up and my other brother and my sister. And they all drew a whole bunch of different things, like a variety of things, you know, like flowers, mountains, bicycles, 
cars. And from, from when I was three years old, all the way up, every single picture I drew in school was of bone arrows. And I've, <laughs> I've got them, I've got them all in, in my mom's uh, hidden kist. <laughs> That's pretty good. Your whole collection so you can of see, bone arrows. <laughs> yeah, you can see it's been a, a, a lifelong obsession. Yeah, yeah, it, it has been. It's that that's kind of, kind of cool that you know as a kid yeah. you're so interested in archery that you know now you made it a, a career. It become yeah, it becomes your 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 full time job. Yeah, and and um, I, it's it's got to be a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, it's and then the nice thing is, um, <clears throat> because I'm also a, a wood wood addict, um, you'll never you never get the same. A piece of wood that looks the same so um and also when you're working with the wood when it's rough you can kind of see the grain like the shape and the pattern but when you get to the end of that bow when it's fine sanded and you you put the finish on and you just see that grain just explode oh in, yeah in color and all that that's 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 quite rewarding um, i i do i do a lot of woodworking as well and um you know, I'll, I'll make duck calls and deer calls and stuff like that on on the, the lathe and other things. And, you know, when I start in a duck call uh, or a deer call, I'll stick it on, get it round, you know, turn the, the yeah. parts in and neat. I'll look at it and say, uh, what design do you want to be? You know, because each one yeah. is like, I might have a design in my head and I turn it around and it's like, no, that ain't going to work. You know, so yeah, yeah. E each wood is, and you can take two pieces of wood, they're going to look different. Yeah. Two pieces of wood, the same species of tree, but they'll look different. And, and even right next to each other, you can take a, a piece and, and cut it in half, and one half don't look like the other when you get them done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that's what's nice about working with wood, is it's that those is. pieces are identical. Yeah. And <clears throat> um, also the thing with me is um, during, during the daytime, <clears throat> Um, I prep a lot of the materials. Um, like I'll get things ready, and then then I then I then I I go back home because my workshop's not far from my house, and then I'll spend a bit of time with the family, um, put the baby to bed, and uh, spend some time with the wife, and then when everyone goes to sleep, that's when <clears throat> that's when I wake up. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like a, a night owl because um, the time for me right now is actually 10, mo 10 minutes past 2 a.m. Oh, and <laughs> that is late and for you. It's not, it's, yeah, but it's not even it's not even my bedtime yet. I, I normally go to bed at 4 a.m. because I, I work in the night time um, and I find that because it's it's peaceful, there's no noise, I get to concentrate and also because I'm, I'm working with epoxy and during the days here in South Africa, it's, it's too warm. And while I'm mixing the epoxy, epoxy is all cured um, on a on heat basis. So if it's very hot, the epoxy um, sets too quickly. Whereas when it's nighttime, it cools down a bit and I get, I get more time before that epoxy sets. So I get a, more than enough time to spread it everywhere I need and it doesn't set as quickly as it would in the daytime. So um, it just makes it like less stressful. If I had to do it in the day, then I'd be rushing. Yeah, and then take the, the hot part of the day and, and sleep. <laughs> be away yeah, from the cold I, I, go do, I, go, I go do things during the day. Um, um, and then I get to bed at about 4 a.m., and then I'll try to wake up at about 10 in the morning. Um, <clears throat> so like a lot of people, like my friends will say, Yo, you sleep late. So, and then I say to them, well, I've had less sleep than what you have because I've gone to bed at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah. That's six hours is enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's plenty enough. Any more than that and wake up hurting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We. We did have one one comment uh, from Janice said, okay. "Part mom uh, to do that, enjoy the memories." <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, well, sorry, what did she say? Um, smart mom to do that, 
to save all your pictures and stuff and then yes and yes. said enjoy the memories <laughs> yes thank you thank you for saying that i'll tell my mom that you you've complimented her <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> she's very smart to save all that stuff yeah i'll i'll my mom's gonna watch this so oh okay uh, i'll <laughs> say hi to I'll, your mom then <laughs> i will yeah yeah hi mom <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she'll she'll watch this tomorrow. <laughs> okay, that'll that'll be good. Yeah, just yeah. in in the group we can watch. It's available now, and then the, it'll come out on the the um, YouTube channel. I think next Tuesday. Okay, awesome. So just just have her go in the group, and she can listen to it there. Um, okay. So that that probably the quickest way to see it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, cool. And I just want to say, yeah, uh, thanks for the the podcast and um, for all the people that's listening and that's going to listen. Thank you for listening. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. I I like a lot of stories, and and it's really interesting uh, talking with you today. And I'm yes. sure we'll we'll talk again later. I'm sure of that uh, sometime, and uh, yeah. um, we'll just catch everybody on the next one. So. Uh, once again, my name is Roy Canterbury. I've been your host on Arch Talk 101 podcast. This is, uh, I think, number 154. So we have a few of them coming out. Um, enjoy them. Uh, make sure you join the Arch Talk 101 Facebook group. There you get to see them when they come out. Or uh, you can catch them on my YouTube channel, Learn to Fix It Yourself. And any place podcasts are, are distributed, as well as on Audible. So make sure you... Hey, catch them out and catch them out. Catch catch the next episode, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for being on the show, work. All right, thank you. Eh? Thank you for yeah. everything. Take care. Yeah, we'll see you later.